Well, I'm pleased to say I'm joined by pressure punter Roger Brook, uh, known as Big Roger or Fat Roger to those who know yeah. and love you. But thank you for joining us here today at uh, Hove Greyhound Stadium, here where you are. have spent how many happy days oh. and months and years of your life? I've been coming since I was 12, Julie. I'm 55 now for my sins. And uh, here we are at 1.40 on a Thursday afternoon. The first race is 6.27. <laughs> so I've got nearly five hours to uh, sort myself before the first race. But anyway, moving on. Um, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been coming here and going out and racing ever since I was a kid, like I was 12 year old, and uh, I got bought by uh, me two best pals at uh, senior school, their mother and father, Barley and Jenny Southern, uh, they bought me here on Boxing Day uh, when I was uh, 12 year old, and uh, I've got to be honest, uh, I know you weren't meant to, but I had a 10p reverse forecast which paid £2.26 and I thought it was Rothschild, so... Uh, of course, fell, fell in love with the game straight away, and it, 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 within six months I was coming to every meeting off my own back, and I used to uh, walk out here from uh, my home, which was right near Brighton Racecourse, which used to take me best part of an hour, like, but I was a lot fitter then, I could do that, you know, I was only a, a whipper of a kid, it was, only, it was when I was 18 or so that I put on all the weight, and here I am now, known as Big Rog, alias Fat Rog, <laughs> but... Uh, no, like, uh, I used to go open racing, I used to abscond from school, if I'm being honest, to uh, go dog racing uh, from the age of 13 and what have you. We used to go and see all the big races in London, occasionally go further afield with a friend of ours, an uh, old boy by the name of Jeff Bodner. I haven't seen him for years, hopefully he's still alive, but I honestly don't know. But um, we used to go away every, like, four times a week we go away. Like, my, my, my greyhound week, would be in them days it'd probably be Romford or Catford on a Monday night it'd be Hove on a Tuesday um, and sometimes I only raced uh, Thursday and Saturday then but anyway I used to come Tuesday Wednesday I'd probably go back to Romford and Thursday I'd always be here Friday used to love Portsmouth Mm. Friday, every single Friday we used to go down, me and my pal Jack and his Mrs Nina and my best pal Dave, Dave Lord, we used to go down there and uh, they used to have a little uh, gas fire on the cheap side, as I always used to call it the cheap side, and um, we all used to sit round it because it was absolutely freezing cold in the winter and what have you, Portsmouth was a cold place but like the amount of characters that come out of Portsmouth, I mean if there was three or four hundred people there on a th Friday night, the majority of them were proper dog people. You know, when, when, you, when you go to these tracks and what have you, you, that's the one thing you always fall back on. Mm. You don't see so many dog people nowadays, which is unfortunate. I know the industry's going in a different direction and they're probably playing towards the younger people and what have you, but you know, I mean, even when you used to go to Ireland, we used to always go to uh, Cork for the Laurels, myself, uh, Alf Ash, Sean Gresham, and we used to go every year. We always used to go to Yall on the Friday night, and that's that's my favourite track in uh, Ireland. And I think, by the way, I think it's a very good place to buy dogs out of. You get bargains out of Yall and what have you. I mean, for instance, Taylor Sky come out of Yall. Mm. And uh, I've always liked going to Ireland. I mean, when I owned dogs, I had them uh, over there with Graham Holland in the main, and we had a couple with uh, Skippy Gilbert, Desi Gilbert and Marie Gilbert. And um, in the main though, we had them with Graham Holland. And in the end, I, I stopped owning dogs about seven or eight years ago, because I've got to be honest, like, I, found it, I found it a big expense, mm. if I'm being honest. I mean, we, we had a dog, uh, my favorite dog we owned was Hondo Dingle. He made, uh, he made the quarterfinal of the English Derby what you would say was an inadequate trip. He was trained by Derek Knight, done a marvellous job with him and what have you. And then he went to the uh, champion stakes at uh, Romford and he was favourite at the uh, semi-final stage and he got knocked out. So we thought we'd try and uh, take him to Ireland, see how he fared in Ireland because he had a sister who, by the way, was the best named dog ever. Perfectly bred, she was called. Anyway, and uh, she, she had a smidgen of class about her, but she uh, kept falling in season. So anyway, we went over there with a view to um, uh, hopefully win some prize money to pay for the mating. Well, the first time he ran, he was in a 1500 uh, euro invitation at Cork, which he won. 
He then was invited to a thousand euro one-off at Thurlis, which he won. And then uh, two weeks after the Irish Derby finish, we went for a competition called the Tote Retention, which was 10,000 euros to the winner. Well, lo and behold, he won it. And we all went over there for the final. And uh, Dennis Fury and myself, uh, one of my pals who owned the dog with us, he, he uh, took me to Navan races and we had a little kitty that day, I'll never forget it, we put in 200 euros, 100 each. I said, I'll leave the horses to you then and you leave the dogs to me tonight. So we went there and he had 50 euros on the last winner, it's the case 50, I think it was about 12 to 1. Like, lovely price, unusual for Ireland, about 12 to 1 winner in Ireland, it's like a 33 to 1 winner over here, but anyway. So we went to a... Uh, Shelbourne, and I was Bilco material. Every single, every single dog I picked kept. Well, anyway, we turned it into nearly eight thousand euros. Wow! And Ondo Dingle won the final. We had a grand on him in the final. What a day! So it was, it was a. That was one of my best racing days in terms of gambling. So you're obviously really, amounts. really enthusiastic about your greyhound racing. But yeah. you talked about when you were a kid and you obviously got that buzz from just having that yeah. 10p bet. So was it greyhound racing that got you into gambling or gambling that got you into greyhound racing? Greyhound racing got me into gambling. Right. Full stop. I mean, you know, I'm, as a kid, um, the family, my family, no one had a penny in the family and what have you. So like mum and dad had no money to spoil us. So I used to go go to my mum's works and I used to borrow a fiver off her when I was 14 and 15. And I've got to be true, but I turned her upside down, bless her. It was only when I got to about 20 where like I made everything right of her and what have you. I used to send her away on holiday twice a year and what have you. Anyway, that's a, I'm not blaming my own trumpet, <laughs> but there you go. Don't worry, she said I was, she said, uh, I was good to her, so that's fair enough and my dad um, and um, like like I say I, I mean if I come out here when I was a kid if I come out here with two quid if I went home with four quid I thought I'd had a touch mm. because A I got enough for the next meeting because that's how that's how a gambler's mind works and what have you obviously I couldn't go in betting shops then I used to stand outside them but I couldn't go in betting shops then what have you little whippersnapper with a pair of shorts on Julie believe it or not and have to be a big uh, bigger now the shorts but anyway that's another story um, and um, like I say I was going open racing I mean my first experience of open racing away from home was uh, Wembley I went to see the uh, St Ledger where Kilmogora missed beat uh, I think Black Earl was a favourite Black, Black Earl was a massive headliner sporting life light headliner every single time it ran and there was a guy around an old guy absolutely respected in the business all the old school would have known him Jack Huss his name was and I used to sit with him at Romford on the uh, cheap side underneath and he used to go there and he always said to me he was a, a northern guy he said never back headliners laddie he said you'll never get any money back in headliners you know and I always remember him saying that and what have you but it's a bit different now I mean because in them days they used to they, they would nap up like Black Earl and it'd be seven to four on. I mm. mean, you know, people like Jonathan Kay and Phil Donaldson and whoever does the racing post and what have you now, they wouldn't even dream of tipping up an odds-on chance. Mm. You know, it's like when you go on the programme with the Racing Post TV, if you tip an odds-on chance, you get snarled at. We do a bit. <laughs> That's it. So, you know, I mean, it's not sort of uh, the... Uh, the done thing. The done what, thing. What, what, age, what age did you become a professional punter then? What age did you make a living well, from I it? I, I mean, I've never called myself a professional punter, but I would say I got good but at... But you've made a living from it. Yes, you've never yeah, done anything else. I would else. say I, I, got, I, got well, I, I got better at it when I was early, mid-30s. Okay. And I would say, 10 years ago, I'm a far better judge of a dog than what I am now, although I get by. I think that was my golden spell What's about the difference? 15 Why? years ago. I just think, like... Nowadays, you, you see so many dogs, you know, and, 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 and you're flooded with it and what have you, you know. And although I like the game, I mean, you know, I find myself watching racing post TV, uh, you know, when it went seven nights, I, I, I was watching it more sporadically, if I'm being honest. But, you know, I like the Friday night meetings at Romford, and I used to love it when this place was on and what mm. have you. I mean, obviously, I used to go on there now and again. Mm. But, uh, 
you know, and, and you enjoy it. I mean, you, you're going on there and, and you're giving your opinions and what have you. Some may, some may agree, some may not, you know, and if, if asked questions, I'd always speak as I see it, you know, I never I never hide behind uh, uh, the screen, so to speak, you know. But, um, you know, in terms, of the, in terms of ground racing nowadays, in terms, like you say, we all know that they're heading towards the younger generation. I'm not, I'm not saying they're casting the older owners and the middle-aged owners out, out, out to cast, but they are aiming at the younger people. They're looking for and people. And that's necessary, to, yeah. isn't it? Well, to of, keep course it going. It, of course it's necessary to get it going, but they need to educate them about the racing side of it mm. rather than the, um, cool, try and think of the word, the uh, hospitality side, if you like, you know, mm. you know, the um, bar and, the, and mm. the food and this, that and the other. And the one thing you've got to do is get the food right at these places, you know, like, I mean, Hove, we're here now, they've had a refurb. And, and and they've made a good job of it. You got a, you got a young racing manager come in now, Daniel Rankin, who who's got his own ideas. He's got his own ideas about the game, and uh, he comes with a good profile, you know, good background and what have you. And uh, the course of time tells me that he'll he'll have he'll have plenty of positive uh, feedback, you know. But um, you still got to get it right, you know, the grade inside of it, and and the owners, and you know. The trainers, the trainers speak for the owners. I think the owners should speak for the owners, personally. I've always thought that. I mean, I've got to be truthful. In my days of owning dogs here, I probably had six bones of contention with Peter Miller, the racing manager. And I've got to be truthful. I think I know what I'm looking at. He was right five and a half times out of six. So there you have it, you know. It, that's just in terms of my dogs and what have you. Mm. And... Um, you know, I mean, the one thing as a gambler, a professional gambler, whatever, when you're doing dog racing, never disrespect your racing manager. How did he do that? How did he do this? How did he do this? You know, the net result is they're a lot cleverer in the main than you give them credit for. That's the one thing. I mean, I've always, I've always looked to that. We've had good racing managers here. You know, I mean, in in my youth, we had Jim Layton. And then Peter Miller took the mould and he was here, I would guess, for 15, 20 years, Peter Miller, you know, and, and they've been shuffling around upstairs for uh, like 18 months, two years now. And now Daniel Rankin's arrived and uh, he's uh, definitely come out the blocks in terms of his ideas and what have you. Rumour has it he's going to be bringing in handicap racing and he must be a, he must be a good grader, let me tell you, because he used to grade umpteen uh, handicaps up north in mm. Shawfield, he never give a dog more than 12. That's yeah. a sign of a good grader. Yeah, yeah. things that's are certainly uh, looking very positive here at Hove. Yeah, that's right, yeah.